All right, good morning, everybody. Um, let's continue our study of uh, probabilistic modeling temporal patterns. Uh, briefly remind ourselves what we have been looking into last time. We uh, begin a very uh, you know, intuitive study, say, of uh, the notion of graphical models. is something that also goes by the name Bayesian networks and um, both these terms were well, graphical model whatever that is something very general Bayesian network is uh, a bit more specific as it suggests that when we study these things we are talking about something in the context of probably Bayes theorem uh, and yeah, as these two terms, they are very well established, but as these two terms are rather unspecific, um, a good monomic as to what that really is we are talking about would be to say, well, in the end, we are talking about uh, conditional, conditional independence, independence diagrams. We've been looking into that, um, saw a couple of examples, uh, met a couple of crucial definitions in this context, and I just want to remind ourselves uh, about one of these crucial definitions or concepts. And uh, you also remember that we're talking about the notion of random variables, in particular in contrast to the idea of uh, propositions. We should be good with that by now, so let us simply assume for you know, this brief reminder that uh, we are dealing with a situation where we are given a set of random variables and let's call this set X. Today I'm calling it X, last time it was called capital S, but we need that S for something else later on. So we are dealing with a set of random variables say x1 all the way up to some xn and for our example we set that n to 5. Uh, now we are interested in the joint probability of these five random variables or uh, we are interested in the joint probability of observing a specific instantiation of the values of these five random variables. So that's we're really interested in the value of the probability of x1, x2, all the way up to some x5. Um, so on the one hand we have this idea of you know the joint probability, some algebraic expression, and on the other hand in this graphical modeling point of view on um, probabilistic models, we saw that we can uh, think of ordered directed acyclic graphs. And at this point, well, I have to make a decision as to which of the two columns uh, to expand. First, let me start with the one on the right hand side. Let's start with the graphical representation of a certain situation we are dealing with. Say for whatever reason we know that there are dependencies among the random variables we are talking about at this point and we could represent them like this. So uh, x2 would depend on x1 and also x3 would depend on x1. And the fourth variable, say x4, would be dependent on x2 and on x3, and the fifth one would then be dependent on x4. Uh, yeah, where, where does this come from? This is just a made-up example. Right? This, you know, in general, you are dealing with situations where you have uh, certain entities, certain things you may be able to measure. Uh, either you can observe them uh, 
directly or they are latent hidden causes but you know that they are there so in practice um, we are usually dealing with phenomena and we want to abstract them we want to describe them in an abstract manner so we have to think about what is it that constitutes our problem what what are the the variables that that influence whatever we are dealing with and how they are interrelated right? once we have decided for let's say the degree of abstraction uh, whatever say the situation in this room I could represent uh, in terms of uh, random variables indicating each variable would be indicating one person in this room uh, and probably all the furniture and whatever uh, that can quickly get out of hand so we you know typically when we do science we have to abstract from from reality we have to decide for the degree of abstraction so in this contrived example we say okay whatever we whatever this is supposed to model it basically can be boiled down to five things we definitely have to talk about and these five things are interrelated as follows and then when we're talking about the real world and we have a model uh, of the real world and then we observe something uh, and maybe even not everything say we would have been able to measure uh, the actual values for these four variables uh, a problem could be that we want to infer given our incomplete information as to the situation as a whole we would want to infer say the value for this variable here and so, so once we have these models about reality or about what's going on in virtual worlds I don't really care uh, once we have these models we can use them for inference so, for instance, this could be something you would observe in the game world and this would represent an activity you would have to, to do once you observe a certain instantiation of, I don't know, enemy, uh, your health value, the um, uh, amount of um, ammunition of the enemy and these things. They are interdependent and they will cause certain, uh, say, things for you uh, to do. And given you observe something, what is the, the best thing you could do? What should be sort of the, the most likely value of this variable in different contexts? So once again, where these, these models actually come from is out of the depth of your brains. You have to accept that. And I'm just drawing things here and we tacitly assume that you know, somebody has thought about something and this is the outcome of this thought process. Now, but once we have these representations, where again every node represents a random variable, something that can assume different values according to certain probabilities, we can then ask for sort of algebraic relationships here. And um, in this case, we would, given this model, factor this joint probability as follows. Let me write it down here. So this would be the probability of x1 times probability of x2 given x1 times the probability of x3 given x1. This is what that model tells us. Times the probability of x4 given x2 and x3 times the probability of x5 given x4. And the crucial thing here is that, of course, this is already a very informed factorization. If we didn't know anything about uh, interdependencies among these random variables, we would have to write down uh, a more extended uh, product here. Right. This, this is not the most general factorization of this joint probability, but this is the factorization that respects this model. Right. And um, I've already mentioned it, that was the crucial definition we encountered last time. We say We 
we say that the joint probability respects respects the graph G, its graphical model of the situation we are dealing with, if it can be factored or factors as x1, let me make it general now, so this is just five variables, but in general we can be dealing with n variables, this joint probability distribution factors as the product where i goes from 1 up to n, and then we have p of xi given this subset, the capital X, uh, sort of uh, with respect to all the predecessors of the current variable xi. Once again, to make this really clear, we use these formalisms to represent events, occurrences, things of the real world. Uh, and for every particular problem, we have to decide what is it that, that are the constituent parts of the problem. What are the things we can easily argue and reason about. Once we have decided for the basic parts, the constituent variables of a problem, domain, we can then begin to think how they are interrelated and we can then, uh, if, if there are easy interrelations, like if they are interrelated that we indeed can represent this as an ordered directed acyclic graph. That is the best thing we can hope for because in that case uh, we know that we can algebraically represent our problem in terms of simple products. This looks not really simple, but in fact it is. In fact, it's, if there were arrows going back and forth, then uh, this would be really, really horrible. Uh, this looks daunting, but it is not. This is a simple product of conditional independencies, uh, conditional probabilities. So we can then represent this situation by equations like this. Once we have these equations, we can begin to think about um, questions as what is the most likely value for x5 given that we have observed certain values for the other four? Or we can ask what is the average value for x2? Or we can say um, given that we have observed this work, what should be the value for x1? So we can, once we have this, we can begin to rewrite these expressions even more, sort of solve them for certain components, you know, uh, compute averages over these things. Uh, and that is what we call inference. Right? That is what we want to do. Again, with respect to the domain of game AI, uh, these four variables could indicate, I don't know, my own internal state, something, um, let's say something about the environment, something about my own internal state, something about uh, the enemy, uh, something about our interaction, my interaction with the enemy, and this could be a variable that represents an activity, a behavior I have to activate in such a situation. And when I say something, 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 you see these somethings can have different instantiations, different values at different points in time, and we talked about rule-based behavior programming, we had like these if-then rules, this is in a certain sense, just a different way of writing down if-then rules and uh, the, the decisions here are based on uh, uncertain information, on probabilities. This is in a sense, very careful now, similar to uh, what we talked about when we talked about fuzzy reasoning, but is a totally different, different thing. This is, is also dealing with, in, you can think of this as a representation of uh, rather complex if-then rules based on uncertain information. Okay, 
So that was uh, what we have been talking about last time. And today, we can further progress towards our general goal of uh, wanting or trying to represent uh, temporal patterns or say behaviors. How can we use uh, this formalism to represent behaviors, uh, to model behaviors, and to reason about behaviors. Hmm? What we are going to study today is a called Markov models. Models. And um, yeah, we do not really distinguish these things today, so we are going to talk about Markov models or Markov chains. You find both terms in the literature. This is a certain way of distinguishing between those we will not really care about this. Um, before we write down mathematical expressions, let me ever so briefly, ever so briefly provide you with the gist of what that is. These are simple models, and I cannot. Uh, stress the fact that they are simple enough. So these are simple models of dependencies in temporal or sequential um, data or processes. So the way we have to read this, um, uh, these are simple models of dependencies in temporal data, or these are simple models of dependencies in sequential processes. Right? Uh, something we observe over time, uh, and we want to model that, these Markov chains would give us a way of doing that. They are the embodiment, embodiment, or the epitome, as you wish, the embodiment of the ideal that, and here is the idea, this is an idea that uh, we should be familiar with from our everyday life. The future is independent, independent of the past given the present. So what I mean by that is that, um, well, in our everyday life we, you know, um, encounter that quite frequently, that uh, whatever comes next does not really depend on what happened before, but on what happens right now. So uh, for instance, uh, you may have a plan for your day, and that involves you, I don't know, uh, catching the bus at some point in time, uh, and to go to the, to the bus stop and then wait for the bus and then continue with your plan. Um, say you miss the bus. So then the future from that point on is different as you sort of would have uh, intended it to be. And that does not really depend on the fact like what happened up until you reached the bus stop, but it happens, uh, or it depends on the fact that you missed the bus when you reached the bus stop. So sort of, it, it, this, is, this is again a confused example. Everything that happened up until you reach the bus is not so important for what will happen next. The future is independent of the past, given the present. And with the formalism we have been developing so far, we can uh, immediately represent this fundamental idea in a diagram. So, um, in other words, in other words, 
uh, let us assume for a set of random variables and uh, this time they will be called x subscript t uh, you know, and this t ranges from 1 up to some capital T or could be infinitely many of them does not really matter uh, for a set of random variables xt we have now it's your turn what kind of a model uh, we have been looking in last time would realize this idea that the future is independent of the past given the present do you remember that we uh, briefly discussed these uh, tail, 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 head, head, head kind of uh, diagrams, possible, like the, the fundamental possible dependencies of, of uh, random variables. And one of the diagrams uh, I've been drawing to you was uh, looking like this. Let me use our new random variables. Um, the last one. This is a graphical representation of the idea that the future is independent of the past given the present. We, we saw uh, a simple graphical model like this last time and uh, then I did some algebra and indeed it turned out that uh, these two um, random variables are conditionally independent if we were to factor the joint probability of a chain like that according to the structure represented in the model. So, and I'm uh, pointing it out already at this point, uh, today and next time, we are talking about random variables that are indexed by time. This, this is uh, probably, uh, again, a bit of a stumbling uh, block at least to me it was when I was a student, because um, in a moment we'll say, okay, so these, uh, these random variables represent certain states, and I say, well, but, but they all represent the <coughs> same set of states, why do we have different random variables? So this is indeed, we can basically uh, say, think of, for instance, the weather as a random variable, and it can be the sunny, rainy, cloudy, snowy, something like that. Or we can blow up our model of the weather and say, well, we do not have the weather as such, but we have the weather yesterday, the weather today, and the weather tomorrow. And, you know, all the way down to the past, all the way up to the future. I, I always considered, considered that sort of not so intuitive, but, um, and this is why I'm stressing. So, we're basically talking about a phenomenon, but we blow our reasoning up such that for every point in time we assign a, a variable. At each point in time there is a variable. We could think of them probably like as, as you know, one variable that assumes different values over time, or we can think of it as lots of different variables that can assume more or less the same values. So this is the way we are going to think about this. We are talking about the weather yesterday, the weather today, and the weather tomorrow. Before we uh, further elaborate on, on this kind of a situation, let us take a step back and uh, consider this problem of abstracting away things that make our life as scientists, uh, scientists difficult. So um, let me let me provide you with a rather abstract example of a temporal process, uh, and I am choosing this by design. It has nothing to do with games, but it helps us to understand um, the sort of underlying, underlying difficulties here and, and what we can do about those. 
example of a temporal process. I said we use Markov models, Markov chains to model and reason about a temporal data, sequential data, temporal processes, sequential processes. Um, a very famous such process, something that does not really happen uh, in our everyday life, is called a random walk. A random walk on the integers, integers, and by that I mean the set of whole numbers. So we're talking about a random walk on the integers. The way we represent this random process is that we assume random variables. Uh, and again, I'll use capital X subscript T, where this T ranges from 1 up to some upper, upper limit capital T. And each of these random variables, each XT, is in a set S, which we identify with the integers. So this is to say, this is the set, I don't know, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, uh, these are the integers. Um, and at this point I have sneaked in the S I have been talking about earlier. This is called, in the context of uh, Markov models, Markov chains, this is called the state space. So I do not really have to define it. We can see what I mean by that. That is, we have a set of variables, and they are ordered. So instead of just talking about we have a number, we talk about we have a number at time t minus 1, we have a number at time t, we have a number at time t plus 1, and so on and so forth. So I have blown up the problem. Right? And well, yeah, every of these random variables is an integer number. And so every of these random variables, this is what they have in common. They will assume values out of the same set. And again, this is a bit crazy because then we could have probably just talked about the random variable x. But instead of just one variable, we say we have a lot of them for every point in time there is an individual variable. Now, what is a random walk on the integers? This is something that uh, can be boiled down to the following statements. Uh, we just assume that the probability for the random variable xt to assume a value of s plus 1 given that the predecessor xt minus 1 had a value of s is 1 half. And the probability for the random variable at time xt plus 1 to have a value of s minus 1 given that its predecessor had a value of s is also one half. And then this, this one's not so important, but I'll write it down that the probability for uh, the random variable x1 having a value of zero is one. So what I have written down here is the definition or specification of a certain random process. And um, we can easily visualize that one. So um, along the y-axis, we have the integers. Say here were 
a zero, plus one, plus two, minus one, minus two, and like this. And along the x-axis, we have, um, now I'll make it x1, x2, x3, and get the picture. Now, I said that the probability of the random variable x1 having a value of 0 is 1. So that is, we start here. And then the probability of, uh, oh, there is another mistake here. This one is superfluous. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, now we have assigned a value to the random variable x1. And this value is zero. We now want to assign a value to the random variable x2. And it can assume two different values. Either it is the previous value plus one, or it is the previous value minus one. So two possible subsequent uh, values of uh, uh, this temporal process are plus or minus one. So we flip a coin, and then if it is head, we, probability one half, would increase the value of s. And let's, let's just do this. Okay. And then we do it again, and we find this, and we do it again, and decrease it this time, right, because now the outcome of our coin flipping experiment was a tail. And we do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. So basically, if we iterate this system of equations here, right, to using these two equations to compute a new value for one of these random variables, something like that will happen. And this is one instance of this process. It could look different. Right? So we could have, if we had lots of heads, uh, by throwing the coin, and we might have ended up here and then down. And you know, this is one instance of this process. This is called a random walk on the integers. Uh, random because you know we really, we, we know we start here but we don't know how this will progress. It's, it's a process that is subject to chance. Hmm? Um, can look different every time we, we run it. So if you program that on your computer, why not do it? Go ahead, do it, and, and let it run. Uh, you have to generate random numbers, and then depending on the outcome of that random number generation, you do either this or that. Plot the curves, they will look different every time. Um, this is something that is sort of removed from our daily life, but the beauty of it is is a, a very simple thing, something we can easily talk about using equations. And so this, this is, you know, in a sense, is a model of possibly more complex things, for instance, in the uh, domain of uh, movements of elementary particles, uh, Brownian motion and, and things like that. This is a sort of scientific abstraction of things that happen in nature. We can study lots of things about these processes. For instance, we could ask the question, given uh, this model, how long would it take until this process reaches a value of plus 1,000 for the first time? Uh, this is a question we can actually really answer using lots of rather um, complicated mathematics. So this is why simple things like that are being studied. Uh, for our case, it helps us to consider the following question. Question. Yeah. Could you explain it? The last one, each of the x1 is zero. So this is just a very fancy way of saying that this process will always start with a value of zero. So it is a process over time. At every point in time, there is some, some integer number. It you know, can be here, can be here. It it's really is random, right? 
But this is just a fancy way of saying that at the very first point in time, we want this number to be zero. And usually this is not made explicit and therefore I have put it into these square brackets. It's just uh, for those of you who might have wondered, well, why did he put the first uh, dot at, at uh, uh, integer of zero here? But if the probability for x1 being zero is one, then it has to be zero. So x1 has to be zero if this probability is one. Now, uh, I have erased it, but you took notes and it is obvious. So I say clearly, clearly the value, the value of xt, that is to say the state at time t. Remember that I said uh, these variables will assume values out of a set S, and that is the state space. So when I say the value of xt, then we can say it is the state at time t. Right? Depends on the value value. This, this is what, what these two equations said. Uh, that it either increases by one with probability one half or it decreases by one with probability one half. So it definitely does depend on whatever value there was before. This one can either be here or there, but it definitely depends on the fact that the predecessor had a value of uh, two. Hmm. But, but, that's not all, but to some extent, it also depends, it also depends on, say, xt minus 2. And by that I mean uh, that, for instance, uh, this variable x3 cannot, cannot be 50,000 50, if we started this process with, uh, I don't know, x1 equals 0. So the, the two equations I erased, they would suggest that the values of these random variables depend on the values of their predecessors. Obviously, right? This is exactly what the equation said. But there is sort of this, this hidden fact, it's not apparent from the equations directly, that the values also sort of depend on, on more of the past than just of the immediate past. So it's for this random walk on the integers, it's impossible to go from here to like in three steps to something like 10,000. This cannot happen. So basically the value at x3 or x4 still depends on, on more than just the immediate past. Mm -hmm. And that is, if we were to write down a graphical model of this random walk on the integers well if we were really really honest we would have to do it like this so we would have to model this as well one that certainly influences x2, which influences x3, which 
uh, influences x4 and so on and so forth. This is apparent from the equations, right? but um, this model would suggest that x3 is independent of x1 given x2. But if we you know, think about it in more detail, then we know that is not the case. So we would basically also have to introduce dependency on x1. And x1 would, of course, also uh, influence x4. And uh, x2 would influence x4, and so on and so forth. All right. So in a, in a sense, this, this is just the first two states, which are uh, three, four states, which I have drawn because then it does not look too clattered. If I were to continue this graphical model, then I would have to have way more arrows, and it becomes uh, even difficult just to draw it. And it becomes even more difficult to write down the equations, the algebraic expressions for the probabilities with which we want to compute. So um, let me let me just state this may quickly get out of hand. This quickly gets out of hand. Out of hand. Becomes too, too tiresome to actually really have the model in this probably necessary generality. This, like, if we are really honest, we would have to represent this random walk on the integers using this graphical model. But therefore, and, and this is what scientists do, therefore, we assume, we assume the following. Um, the recent past is more informative than the distant past. Once again, what we are doing here is I am walking you through the process of actually modeling a situation we are dealing with using these graphical models. And we are dealing with the situation of the silly, simple, random walk on the integers. This is a very, this is an abstract idea, uh, something we can easily uh, argue about using um, elementary mathematical equations. So this is something uh, artificial. It's, it's not something you would observe if you uh, walk along the street. But that is the situation we are dealing with. Even this situation, if we were really honest, would lead to very difficult models, to very cumbersome models, models that would involve lots of dependencies. And this is what, what scientific thinking is now. It's like, okay, so um, basically that is the situation we're dealing with, but this is too complicated. It's too complicated. It's hard, hardly possible to to write down the equations and then solve them and even on a computer it may take you know a lot of time to do inference with a model like this so let us assume uh, the situation is not quite so complicated for instance let us get rid of this here and you know it's still a difficult model in a sense but not as complicated anymore we can say, you know, this is, this is, this is uh, still, this is probably not as valid a model of what is really going on, mm, but it is probably good enough for whatever our purpose is. And maybe we can represent this phenomenon of random walks on the integers with this model. 
that if we want to ask for the probability, how likely is it for this process to reach a value of 10 within the first 20 steps, these are questions we could ask. This is, this is what, what we do science for. We, we want to ask uh, things um, which probably have not been observed yet, but we have models and we can use them to predict this. And then if the model would correctly predict, okay, it takes like 50 steps in time to first reach a value of 10, then that would be a good model. Um, so this is why we use these models. We want to infer something about complex processes, the behavior of this random walk. And this is not the best model anymore. It is an abstraction. It is an abstraction. And we have only abstracted it to simplify our lives. This is because we are lazy. This is because we are lazy. But maybe this abstraction is still good enough to argue about what's really going on. Well, we could say, okay, this, this, is, this is already better, but still um, <laughs> too complicated. Let's simplify it further. Right. And then it would look like this. Now, um, we could say, yeah, this, this, is, this is probably uh, good, uh, but let's, let's simplify it further. Right. And then, uh, you see, there is, there is a point at which you should stop simplifying. All right. But this is seriously how these models are being built. Like, you are dealing with a problem, say, in the context of game AI, and you want to model it. And if you sit down and think about the problem long enough, your model will be very complicated. And then you have to begin to ask, well, can I simplify it? And then you have to ask, well, up to which point can I simplify it? Right? And uh, the gist of what we are talking about today is that when we are talking about temporal processes, that this is sort of the, the bottom line. <laughs> We can simplify up to here, and that's probably brutal because we have uh, neglected dependencies that are there, but which would complicate our lives, but let's ignore them. But we shouldn't go any further, okay? So this is why I have been talking about random walks on the integers just to make this point. Okay, I'll write it down. So, um, everyday experience suggests that the recent past is more informative than the distant past. And that is mathematically, um, mathematically, um, we would therefore choose our model of the random variable xt, the state of a system at time t, we would choose that to depend, to depend on, I don't know, say the uh, previous state, xt minus one, the state prior to that one, up to some state, what do I call it here? x d minus m and that m is uh, a constant something we fix something we choose so um, if we would say okay so state at time t only depends on that it boils down to this um, x at t is conditioned on x and t minus one And everything that happened prior to xt minus m, prior to the last m steps in time, we ignore in our model. Like this, this is the embodiment of the intuition that the recent past is more informative than the distant past. When we want to argue about xt, we have a certain temporal time frame, a window back into the past up to m steps backwards, but everything that happened prior to that is, is not of importance to us anymore. So then how to choose this m? Right? And the simplest, simplest choice, simplest choice 
is n equals 1. And this is what defines a Markov chain. And I will write it down because this is so important, but we are now well positioned to understand it. So, Soon we have um, discrete, discrete random variable x1, x2, I don't know, I fixed an upper bound of t, each of which can have a value in a set S which is discrete. It can be a very large set, so the integers is uh, a set of infinite size, but it's countable. It's a discrete set. This is what I mean by discrete random variables. In our previous example, each of these x's had a value of 1, of 2, or 15, or whatever, but of course, a value out of a discrete set, so the random variables are discrete. Um, so we have discrete random variables at discrete time. I should I write it down here. At discrete time. Discrete time. And by that I mean basically that this subscript T is also something discrete. If we have a process with a beat. There is a beat, and, and at every beat, we observe a new state variable. These things, discrete random variables over discrete time, form a Markov chain. Markov chain. If there joint probability respects, and we know what this uh, term respects refer to, if their joint probability respects this model, x1 influences x2, influences x3, and so on, uh, that is, if the joint probability all the random variables. Uh, I'll write it like this. If the conditional probability uh, of xt, if xt conditions on xt minus 1, xt minus 2, all the way down to x1, if this simplifies to xt just in condition on xt minus 1 and being independent of everything else in the past. This is a discrete time marker. thing and then we have to make the relation to computer games again. And here is what I want to point out. Um, again something that, that did confuse me when I was first exposed to all of this. There are two uh, graphical graphical views viewed on
some Markov chain. Markov chain. The first one is the one we just discussed, so the uh, conditional independence diagram. That is to say, the thing I just erased. So this, this is a, a graphical representation of a Markov chain. This is a representation that tells us how the random variables we are interested in are interrelated. It tells us about interdependencies between random variables and in particular it tells us once again that the future is independent of the past given the present. Okay, but there is this second representation of Markov chains, which you may have seen in the in literature or previously before. And these are these state transition diagrams. Transition diagrams. And we have to briefly familiarize ourselves with those. So, to this end, we first recall that what I wrote down on the previous whiteboard, namely this uh, probability of xt conditioned on xt minus 1, is nothing but a shorthand, shorthand for the expression um, that probability for xt having a value of, let's say, si, given that xt minus 1 has a value of, say, xj. Remember, this is something we discussed last time, that we are too lazy to write it always in this, in this entirety here. And so this, but, but whenever you see something like this, what you mentally have to think about is actually this. Right, this uh, probability of xt given xt minus 1 is actually to say the probability that xt has a value of si given that xt minus 1 has a value of sj. And these si and sj are states in our state space, in this set of possible values of the uh, random variables. Okay, let me continue this up here. Now we have uh, to introduce another term, another uh, definition, which I'll just sneak in. And again, I'm doing that deliberately because uh, typically this is just sneaked in unless you read uh, a very lengthy book on Markov chains. And there are excellent, excellent books out there. All of this is tremendously well understood. This is, this is, uh, be careful with, with claims like this. this is very powerful formalism. Uh, we, we can prove and deduce extremely many things from simple conditional independence models like Markov chains. There is a lot that is known about this. And one of the notions that occurs is the following. If the Markov chain, Markov chain is time homogeneous genius. sometimes people yeah, don't talk about time so if the Markov chain is homogeneous uh, that is to say if the probability that the random variable that indicates the state at time t actually has a value of si given that the previous state um, was sj. 
substitute this with exactly the same probability as, um, I'll write it like this, x at some time tau, this is the Greek letter tau, so this is t, this is tau, it's just another way of indicating time, has a value of an i given that x tau minus 1 has a value of Finish the sentence in a second, but we first have to understand what it means to, to use a different index identifier here. And that is basically to say, if let's let's fix some value for this t five. If the state at time five has a certain value, given that the state at time 4 had a certain other value. If the probability for this observing a transition from state j to state i from time 4 to time 5, if this is the same as, let's say, tau is 15,000 and tau minus 1 is 14,999, if transitioning from sj to si between time 14,999 and time 15,000, if it is equally probable to do this transition from Sj to S Si at a different point in time, then we say the chain is homogeneous. This is basically to say that it does not matter at what point in time we are when we observe such a transition. Okay? Now, if it is homogeneous, and this is what that says, the, the, the homogeneousness is in the choice of t and tau. If it does not matter at what point in time this happens, we may just as well write Just as well right, that the probability of xt assuming a value of si given that xt minus 1 has a value of sj. Um, well, that is basically to say that the is the same as the probability of, you know, going to state i from state j. This, this is what this says. This is a homogeneous Markov chain. Um, we can basically ignore the dependence on time, but are just interested in how likely is it to observe the system switch state in the random walk of the integers it has to switch state that that was like a definition there but we'll see an example in a second and uh, yeah there again we are lazy uh, instead of writing the probability of observing as as i given that we just observed as j uh, will now be written as t subscript ij If this is the case, so this, this sentence still continues. Oh. Let me refresh. I said there are two graphical views on Markov chains. The one is the one we have been talking about up until so far. It's this uh, uh, graphical models that, that indicate dependencies or independencies between random variables where we said for each point in time we introduced an own variable and then I said well if the uh, chain is time homogeneous so it's basically to say all that matters is transitions between states and not so much when they happen we can represent these conditional probabilities we have been talking about so far like so and this we abbreviate like that right? 
But if the chain is homogeneous, we can write this and the center continues and we present the chain the chain in terms of state transition from homogeneous. State transition probability. Probability. And here is uh, an example, e.g. for the random walk on the integers. We would have the following representation of the Markov chain. So we have a state that is zero. This is the, the state this process started in. And then we have a state that is one. And there is a probability that if we are here to go to this state and in the model that probability was one over two. And at the same time, now once we are in that state, there is a certain probability to go back to this state of zero, and that was one over two. We could also go to a state called two, with a probability one over two, and from two we could go back to one, with a probability one over two, and that's also like this. Also, we could have a transition from zero to minus one, with a probability of one half and from one to zero with a probability of one half. Okay. So uh, this is another representation of a time homogeneous Markov chain. And this, this is a typically um, the representation in which it is talked about. But what I have done now is that I have derived this representation coming from the graphical model point of view. We, we said, okay, so the graphical model is this, and then the um, uh, algebraic expression is this, but this is just a shorthand for this, this extended version P of xt equals s of i, given that xt minus 1 equals S, sj. And if it's time homogeneous, then it's basically the probability of like uh, um, si given sj. And there you have it. And this is, of course, very reminiscent of the uh, finite state machines we have been talking about uh, a couple of weeks ago. Because now we have a process that can assume different states over time. We don't really care uh, what point in time it is, but we know there are like here very many states, infinitely many, but we know this is a model of a process that can have different states over time. And this indicates how we can transit from one state to the other. Okay, and um, I don't know what happened, but we're running out of time. So let me um, tie this up with an example. In game AI, and uh, which is meant to indicate uh, how these kind of, of probabilistic models might be useful for our purposes. Okay, so here is a game AI example. Game AI example. Um, let us assume that we have a state space S and that is basically uh, consisting of three states. Um, let, let me say room A, room B, and room C. So here is another dungeon example probably. Let me draw you a part of a game map. So we have uh, this, and this, and uh, I don't know, something like 
This is uh, a game map, right? Some dungeon, we are looking on top of it. This one is called room A, this one is called room B, and this one is called room C. Um, so, uh, a player, if we sort of confine ourselves with this part of the game world, can be in uh, each of these rooms and transit between them. Right, so there are corridors between those rooms. Um, well, if the player is in room A, we would say it is in state A. Hmm? If it is in room B, we would say it's in state B. And if it's in room C, then of course it is in state C. Um, and let us assume that here in room B, down here in the corner, there is a treasure. Hmm? Okay. This is uh, a game map, and um, it conveniently provides us with a state space. And from now on, I will drop the prefix room, so let me, I'll just erase it here. Uh, right, so we have three states a player can be in. And now let us assume that we have um, two Markov chains, two of them. Two Markov chains, and um, in the literature, these things are often called lambda one and lambda two. So lambda is this uh, generic variable uh, to refer to a Markov chain, and they have they are two Markov chains over this state space. The first one, so basically given that we just briefly discussed these uh, state transition diagrams. Uh, let me draw it, C, and we have um, probabilities of transiting between these states. Um, this, this gets cluttered, but it's, it's still bearable, I guess. So this is, this is um, a graphical representation of the fact that a player uh, can be located in state B, in the room B, and then from there go to room C, which is possible, yes, because they exist. From C go to A, or from A go to C, you know, every, every error here indicates a possible transition from a state to another. We also have these self-transitions. That is to say, if at time T, player is in room A, and at time T plus one, the player is still in time, uh, room A, well then there was a transition from A to A. So, now let me ever so briefly um, add numbers to that 0.2 uh, and this is 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0.5, 0.3 These numbers are the probabilities we just talked about these PIJs This this is the probability uh, of transiting from A to B So this this uh, Makes sense. This uh, P B A is 0.5. It says that if we observe uh, the player in room A, there is a probability of one half that the next point in time the player will be in room B. Hmm? If you look at this Markov chain. And the beauty is I can talk about this as a Markov chain. 
right? We, we just established that, that this state transition diagram with its time homogeneous defines the chain. If you look at it, can you already tell me what kind of behavior that represents? So let's, let's check out, let's start in C. Uh, what is the most likely transition from C? A. A. Now we are in A, what is the most likely transition? B, A, B? Yeah. Okay, so this is basically somehow a model of running around in circles. And it can be happening that we are here and then stay here and then stay there and then go back. And, but like the most likely thing that will happen under this Markov chain is that we observe transitions like these. Right? So we can call this Markov chain uh, lambda one is representing the behavior of patrolling this map. If the player would behave such that we could represent his or her behavior using this Markov chain, and we just saw it's basically running around in so like most likely, not always, but most likely there is a tendency of this representing running around. So let's say this is patrolling the area. Hmm? And here is uh, the second one. So we have again the three states. A, B, and C, and all these transitions. Right. And now I will fill it with numbers again. Uh, 0.25 with the probability for self-transition from A to A. We have 0.8 here, and 0.25 here, and then 0 0.5, 0 0.1, uh, and here is 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and two more, and we are good. 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. Look at this. Assume the current state of the player is being in room B. What is the most likely next state? Staying there. Right. Okay, let's, let's say there is a certain probability for going from here to there. Now we are here. What is the most likely next state? Going back. Going back. So this Markov chain would represent a sequence of states where it's very likely to observe lots of consequent uh, sub, sub patterns of being in B, right? So this, this uh, could then be a representation of the behavior of guarding the treasure, right? Guard. Great. Now, um, this is this is all right. You know, this is not really something we have uh, never talked about before, because we have been talking about finite state machines. When we were talking about finite state machines, we could use these things to generate behavior, right? And of course, we can use these Markov chains. Uh, in, in a very similar similar sense. Uh, these are, in a way, non-deterministic finite state machines. Because you could think of being in a state, then generate a random number, and depending on the outcome, either go there, stay here, or go there. It's not deterministic what will happen next. It depends on chance. The very interesting thing in comparison to what we did when we talked about finite state machines is that we can use these things also the other way around. We can use these things to infer what is going on in the game world. And I will now erase this one, but um, I hope you have taken notes so you have all these probabilities here, right? In contrast, so once more, 
We can use them if we would want to, to generate behavior. And, and that would be very randomized behavior. Of course, there are tendencies because here, more likely to produce long sequences of being in room B. Um, but these are ways of how we could generate behavior or sequences of states. Like once we have uh, produced a new state, then a script would have to be activated, like the, the whole gems we talked about. But we can also use this in contrast to the finite state machine. We can use that for inference. And the question is uh, how do you inference with Markov chains? If MC, you find it quite frequently, uh, frequently. Markov chains. And uh, let's study this question by means of an example. Let us ask what is going on if we observe the enemy, say, the enemy, our, our opponent in the game, uh, in the following, following sequence. So we have A, A, B, 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 C, B, B, A. That is the question. And again, this question comes from our original desire here. We are talking about behavior programming. And we have seen how we can realize reactive behavior. And we have seen that more complex variants of behavior, tactical and strategic behavior, require temporal context. And that temporal context requires us to be able to reason about what is going on about longer periods of time. And this is now the first instance of where we actually do it. We have an observation of what our opponent did for the last 10 steps in time. And if we could classify this, if we could say, oh, the guy is currently doing this or that, we can deduce what, how our reaction should be. Right? So if we are able to recognize behavior over longer periods of time, we can um, produce tactical behavior ourselves. So that is our question. How do we answer it? Well, we use uh, what we have been talking about. Probabilistic inference. That is, let us ask. Uh, the answer is, let us compute the joint probability of this sequence of events. So A, A, B, 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 A, A. Sorry, I got it wrong. C, B, B, and A. Um, in particular, let us compute the probability of this sequence given model 1. And let us compute the probability of this sequence given model 2. This is the answer to our question. Like, what is going on? We'll try to explain what we observe in terms of the models we have. Right? Okay. Now, for lambda one, the one I erased, we have we have that this joint probability of all this stuff, which is basically we can factor this now using this Markov property that random variable x1 has a value of a, this is the first probability, times the probability that random variable x2 has a value of 
uh, a given that x1 has a value of a times uh, x3 has a value of b given that x2 has a value of a times n so on and so forth right you see the the thing um, now We, and this, this is now, again, also another first timer, because now for the first time ever, we will actually insert numbers for these probabilities here. Right? So far, like uh, for, for, for the last couple of lectures, we have all the probability of A given B times probability of B, uh, whatever. Now, for the first time ever, we'll actually use numbers. This is funnily enough that, that we can talk about this very abstractly and then finally use it. Now, probability um, of the first random variable in our temporal sequence having a value of 1 is 1 because this is what we know, this is where we started. Right? So this one here has a value of 1. Now we ask for the probability um, x2 having a value of 1 given that x1 had a value uh, of x2 having a value of a given that x1 had a value of a. I have erased the wrong one, but if you look it up, uh, that should be 0.3, right? And so, yeah, we can then just look at these transition arrows and read those probabilities from there. And we will find this is uh, times 0.5 times uh, 0.3 times 0.3. This is 0.3 times 0.5 times 0.2 times 0.3 times 0.2. This you look it up. Uh, if if you if you took notes as to the numbers I, I put, you would just look up the numbers on these arrows for lambda one, not for lambda two, and write them down. Multiply it together, and we find that this multiplies to 0.0000025. So this is the probability that uh, the sequence we have observed could be explained by the behavior of patrolling the area. Mm -hmm. This is not a really large number. Okay, then let's do this for the other model we have. Uh, so the joint probability of this is the corresponding uh, condition probabilities and you know, then we have one times 0.25 times and so on and so forth. If we multiply these uh, numbers all together, we get that this is about um, 0 0.00026. Still not a very large number, but considerably larger than the one we had before on order of magnitude. And there you have it. This is how we use Markov chains for inference. Um, we have tested an observation against two models and we find that one model gives an explanation of our observation that is more likely than the ex explanation of the other model. So, having observed this sequence of uh, A, A, B, 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 C, B, B, A, yeah, it is more likely that it has been produced by the Markov chain that represents the garden behavior. There you have it. And there you see also like um, how, how this works in general. Um, you know, you can have many different behaviors and for each of them you would have such a Markov chain. And uh, if you want to, to know what is going on, not just from the current observation as we did so far when we had this if-then rules, like what is going on right now, but if you want to in include temporal context, here you have a way of how to do that. 
if you have different models of different things that can go on, you can now use very simple probability computations to compute the likelihood, say, of the observation given this model, the likelihood of the observation given the other model, and so on and so forth. One of them is probably the most likely one. And here we could infer that the opponent player is currently guarding the treasure. And given that we know that, we can probably do something about it. For, and this makes sense, if, because if the opponent was uh, patrolling the area, we could ourselves activate a different behavior of getting to the tre treasure than now that we know that it is uh, being guarded. So maybe for us as a non-player character who has to, to get to the treasure, um, we now have to fight because we know it is being guarded. If the opponent was patrolling the area, could have tried to sneak in, steal it, and sneak out again. So different, different temporal context, different possible activities on our part. There you have it. Um, just to, to wrap this up, um, it is not just like we can do so much more with, with these uh, probabilistic models. Right? Uh, for instance, you could ask yourself uh, the question. Um, what is the probability to observe uh, sequence A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, something like that, uh, given lambda 1. Uh, you can also ask probabilities of um, how likely is it uh, for the player to remain in, in room B, given lambda 2. Get, get this, we have observed this sequence, we have established probabilistically that this sequence indicates that the treasure is being guarded. Then we can ask, well, for how long will the guy remain in that room? How, how, like now, we are here in the vicinity somewhere, we have established it is being guarded. We can use these models to ask questions different than the ones we just asked. We can ask, how, how long will it stay there still from now on? And there, we can use this to compute the probability for that. And then depending on the outcome of that question, we can either attack or wait. You know, there you have it. There you have it. So, uh, that is all for today. Next time, we will have to think about something crucial here. Uh, because if we use these states in the Markov J to represent uh, a player being in a room, then it's cool because then uh, the state of the enemy is actually the same as what we observe. But sometimes, we can observe something, but have to have to infer what state the the uh, opponent is in. So what I want to say is, in these examples here, uh, the states we defined coincide with what we can observe. But um, if we want, for instance, to infer if a player is playing aggressively or passively from observing a battle, we do not observe immediately if this is passive or aggressive fighting, uh, but we observe like how often, I don't know, uh, a sword is, is uh, chosen or, or whatever. We observe things from which we have to infer certain states. And this is exactly, we have to infer hidden states and this we'll do next time, we'll extend these Markov models to hidden Markov models. Are there any questions for today? Great, if not, uh, see you this afternoon and uh, otherwise next Thursday. Thank you.